Well, hey, I'm going to talk a little bit today about a case called uh, Gagnon versus Scarpelli. That's spelled G-A-G-N-O-N. Uh, S-C-A-R-P-E-L-L-I and the full citation is 411 U.S. 778 it's a 1973 case and so basically what it talks about is probation violations which came up uh, in our uh, forums already by one of the students who has some experience in uh, jails I think it's uh, Nicole but anyway I guess what I'm trying to get across to you is that there's, you know, a couple different points that are important here. One of them is, um, you know, we all see through a glass darkly, as it says in the Bible. And what that means is, my experience was in probation. And so I saw what happened in probation. Her experience is in jails, and anybody that's uh, like a police officer, his experience is a police officer. And that affects or kind of slants your view of other things. And the problem with it is, in the criminal justice especially, it's uh, real problematic because we start developing these them or us uh, attitudes. And what I mean by them or us is that we are them. Uh, or, or they are them and we are us. Let me get it right here. But anyway, uh, us, we know what's best. We know how everything we works based on what we do. And uh, so basically, um, you know, we got a handle on everything. Well, the problem with that attitude is that um, that's not always true because you don't see the full picture from where you're sitting. So if you're in law enforcement, you see the arrest side, and then you see that you have to go in and testify. Some guys get an attitude like, hey, this is my case. I arrested the guy. This guy better get what I want him to get. In fact, I used to see it all the time. And that's not how the system's supposed to be uh, played. I mean, you know, the way it's supposed to work is it's a collaborative effort. We all need to collaborate. This is a big failure in criminal justice in the USA, in my estimation, after working since 1975 and different parts of it. Uh, and so, like I said in my post uh, response, I think that, uh, you know, probation has value. I think we need more probation, not less of it. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at all the offenders in the U.S. right now, something like two-thirds of them are on probation or parole at any one given moment. And that's in the millions. There's over a million people in prison and jail right now. It's like 1.2 million people in prison and jail. So that means that there's like three and a half million people on probation or parole. Now you tell me this, if we did away with probation, where are we gonna put all these prisoners? It's impossible. We just need to carve off a space in like Montana or somewhere and put a big old wall around. I think there's like uh, prison New York or something like that. Back in the 70s, they made a movie about where they just walled off New York City because it was just out of control. Which is so crazy because today, uh, New York City is one of the most law-abiding places in the country, believe it or not. But anyway, getting back to probation, like I've said in my post, there's two kinds of probation violations. There's a technical violation. Uh, technical violation is when the uh, person... Uh, can't pay their fine or they can't pay their child support because they got no job, you know, and they've been all around. They've looked for a job. They get a violation because they don't get a job. How can you violate somebody because they don't get a job? I mean, it's not up to them to get a job. Yes, they've got to go out and ask, but uh, it's up to the employer to give them a job. If the employer's not going to give them a job, how's that a violation? And should that end their probation? I mean, that's the kind of questions. Now, the flip side of it is a true legal violation of probation is when an offender commits another offense. And that's what we get into. This is a long preliminary comment, but when we get into Gagnon or Gagnon or however you want to say it, it's G-A-G-N-O-N, I mean, he had a violation for robbery, which surprises me. He was given probation for armed robbery. I've never seen that happen in 30 years. I mean, armed robbery is going to pull some kind of prison sentence. I'm sorry. 
you know. Uh, but in no, in Wisconsin, they're they're kind of unique, uh, progressive, and so um, he was sentenced to 15 years, but he was ordered to serve seven years of probation. So while he's on probation, he gets arrested in Illinois for burglary. And so, ipso facto, because he was arrested in Illinois for burglary, the Wisconsin court violates his probation. No hearing, no lawyer, no witnesses, no real proof, just they get a report, he was arrested in Illinois for burglary. He's not been found guilty of burglary in Illinois. He has not been even given any kind of a hearing on the charges for burglary in Illinois. And he's not given a hearing for any kind of charges in Wisconsin. And so the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that that was a violation of his 14th Amendment rights. And I think that this is where some of this confusion comes into play. Where traditionally we always said, well, uh, offenders give up all their rights when they go in uh, the jail. I think that's what the author says, Samaha. But anyway, uh, that's not always true. In other words, you have an 8th Amendment right. Uh, to avoid any kind of cruel and unusual uh, punishment. But all citizens of the United States have a 14th Amendment right to due process and equal protection of the law. And so the court ruled that, yes, he had a right to a hearing. Now, some of the evidentiary rules are not the same as like for a jury trial, but you do have a right to at least have a hearing to explain your side of the story, to have a lawyer there if you want to, to subpoena witnesses, and, you know, to test, uh, you know, is this the same, for example, is this the same guy, uh, this uh, Gerald Scarpelli, is he the same guy that was arrested in Illinois, or is he the guy uh, that's living in Wisconsin, a uh, law-abiding citizen? Uh, I mean, there has to be more. Uh, and so that's why there has to be some kind of... Uh, uh, hearing, procedural hearing, to allow the person to explain their side of the story. And I think that kind of frustrates jailers sometimes uh, because they want to streamline everything and just move them on down the road. But that's not always uh, fair, and it would be even less fair if it was you or one of your kids that was being falsely accused. I think that's our biggest problem that we can't wrap our head around is sometimes we could be falsely accused. You know, oh, I'm a law-abiding citizen. I have nothing to hide. Uh, this will never happen to me. Yeah, well, tell it to the Jews in 1930. Four million of them were killed just because they were Jews. And that's why we have such a strong uh, stance on uh, our freedoms. And, uh, and that's why we go through some of these procedures. You may think, well, uh, it's just a dog and pony show. But it, it's really not. Uh, and it is because everyone in this country deserves uh, some de degree of due process at every stage of, of their cases. So uh, that's what came out of this uh, Gagnon versus Scarpelli, 411 U.S. 778. It's a 1973 case. Recommend that you give it a look. Also another case that comes up. In this same discussion is the case of Morrissey versus Brewer. Morrissey is M-O-R-R-I-S-S-E-Y versus Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E -E like Milwaukee Brewer. So uh, these different uh, parts of this then uh, indicated that everybody has some um, rights to a hearing, uh, even if it is for probation violation. So it's not automatic. Uh, you know, go to jail. So uh, that's just one of the ones that we're going to include this week. Uh, we'll add some more as we go along here, but just trying to find some different cases that pertain to what we're talking about and what we find in our chapters. So hope you enjoyed it. Uh, carry on uh, with your discussion. Everybody's doing a fantastic job, so just stay in touch.